So it's a lovely early morning here in Bangalore. Oh, and I hope actually, uh, in, any, in any case, actually, we are all, in a sense, you know, um, moving out of our uh, uh, challenging situations um, uh, a month ago. You know, it's it's progressively getting positive, uh, uh, good news. That means, uh, in, in a sense, we have to say uh, the low, the positive count, is the better, the higher the good news is. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's all happening um, in India, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, you know India's best and best of best of hospitality professionals joining us for this um, uh, one of those rare opportunities to actually interact with a global legend, a global living legend, Professor Chakitan S. Dev from Cornell University, and now he's also an eminent professor at the Singapore University. So uh, thank you so much once again, and I I, I just can't uh, you know uh, thank enough thank him enough for agreeing to come and join us. Uh, it's a great opportunity for all of us. We are all his students. So I have the privilege and pleasure to um, bring you another uh, uh, seri uh, leadership series face to face. That's that's the focus face to face leadership talk. Um, Professor Chakitan as Dave. Singapore Tourism Distinguished Professor in Asian Hospitality Management, award-winning professor of marketing. Well, he is, of course, uh, the unquestionable guru of marketing and professor of management at Cornell University, SC Johnson College of Business in the School of Hotel Administration. Thank you, sir. And once again, on behalf of the entire hospitality industry in India, and I have this privilege to say that because I've spent, spent almost about 45 years in this industry. Uh, I welcome you wholeheartedly, not just as an eminent professor of the university um, in Cornell, which is like the temple of hospitality administration in the world. I also as someone who hails from India. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. We are 67. Morning, Dr. Dev. It's it's fantastic to see a large, intelligent audience all ready for you at 6:30 or 7:30 in the morning in India. Uh, you know these things don't happen in India. Take it down. It is it is beautiful to see you chat to hoteliers in India. I know your words of wisdom will do everyone good. Um, and congratulations on this forum. Mohan has been working very, very hard and very passionately on it for, for many, many months. All the very best. Have a fantastic morning. So that was Mr. Ajay Bakaya, who needs no introduction, uh, probably, you know, internationally too. Um, you know, he's one of the most, he's a role model. He's an iconic general manager of the Oberoi Group at one time and uh, obviously grew up to become one of the towering leaders of the Indian hospitality industry, the chairman and managing the, the managing director of Sar Sarova Group of Hotels. Uh, I, you know, he's one of my very close friends and uh, I'm a fan of his. Uh, you know, he's in, 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 in every sense a perfect hotelier, a quintessential hotelier. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, he's in Paris, so he's away there. So he was very kind enough to uh, send this message to you, sir. Thank you. Great. Go ahead. Thank you, Ajay. I very, appreciate very much the uh, opening remarks and your encouragement. And I hope I can live up to the words you just expressed. So let's get started. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to what's going to be another, we have about 50 minutes together to try to give you some things to think about. And what I want to do is I want to start out by positioning this conversation and this discussion within the topic that Mr. Mohan Kumar Pique has laid out. And that if you go to the first Ask if you go to my first opening slide, and I have my first question for the audience. I do have a challenge for you. So if you go to the presentation mode, that would be great. I'll just give it a second there. We're almost there. Can you get in presentation mode? Sir, uh, uh, in, just before you start, can we have a couple of words from Dr. Pirinandan Reddy? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Bhaskar, uh, I thought I would introduce him 
uh yeah I, as he has his wish uh, just after uh, the uh, this presentation but uh, let me just acknowledge yeah. the presence yeah. of uh, yeah. Dr. yeah let me just acknowledge the presence of dr priyanand reddy the very dynamic C, uh, ceo of aims uh, and a great friend of mine and uh, you know he has huge vision for hospitality management education in india uh, and he is the creator and and and, and the mover of aims uh, institute university and institute of hospitality uh, uh, um, um, welcome uh, priyanand uh, if you just share with us some of your thoughts opening thoughts thank you thank you very much sir uh, dr dev welcome uh, to this wonderful session created by the gms guild of india and thanks to mr mohan kumar uh, sir uh, for uh, giving us the opportunity to associate uh, on this initiative um, and and good morning to all the participants all the gns all the distinguished uh, guests i also see some uh, students from aims attending this event so i'm sure it's a great uh, learning curve for them as well um, i think i think aims in its 27 years of journey as a hotel school uh, has taken great strides uh, in in reaching the top 5 private hotel schools in india today thanks to our men, uh, mentors and advisors like mr mohan kumar sir who's been uh, uh, a part of our journey he's been guiding us uh, and uh, you know it's been it's been through his uh, great support that uh, we have taken a lot of initiatives um, to add value to our students journey and uh, going forward i think we also look forward to uh, show our gratitude by creating a platform for the industry uh, the hotel industry uh, in india uh, so so we've been uh, discussing a lot of things with uh, mr mohan kumar sir and uh, hopefully we'll get things uh, rolling out soon uh, in our new facility that's coming up uh, closer to the international airport in bangalore um, i welcome all the participants all the attendees once again i won't take much time uh, i i would like to thank you once again uh, professor dev uh, I, I would like to hand it over back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to honor Priyanand. Uh, you know, uh, with someone like him, I feel so energetic and young uh, because he in, in instills that whole inspiration in, among all the students, and he has this big uh, vision uh, of bringing uh, a global connect of global knowledge of hotel administration management into India. So, and not only will he be talking about the graduates of the college. He is, in fact, actually having. We've been collaborating and having this uh, uh, thought share to see how we can actually bring in even the practicing general managers into a leadership program somewhere in the future. And uh, and uh, how, how can I miss that opportunity to tell in front of uh, the guru here? Thank you so much. Wonderful, and I and I want to, Mr. Mohan Kumar. I want to acknowledge your uh, flying the flag in the backdrop. I love your T-shirt on the window. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so a passionate <laughs> Wonderful, Mr. Reddy. Thank you. Uh, let's get started. So, Basu, yes. if you want to put up the first slide in the proper form, we can get going. There we go. So, when Mr. Moon Kumar contacted me several weeks ago, and we began to talk about the topic for this session, he said, "I wanted to talk about hospitality leadership in a VUCA world." And some of you may have been paying attention, maybe not. But if if somebody in the chat can tell me what VUCA stands for, I'm going to give you 15 seconds. Mr. Mohan Kumar is monitoring the chat. Mr. Mohan Kumar, please tell me whoever gives the right answer first time. Okay. And we'll announce their name, and then I'll reveal the acronym, and we'll get started. So Vuka. I think let let's give the honor to Vishnu uh, Jagade, uh, who came in first. Wonderful. All right, let's put it up now. If you do the animation, Bosco, if you advance the slide. Good job, Vishnu. There we go. You can just so, unmute your yeah. Wonderful. Yes, so a uh, kind of a you know mouthful, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So very quickly, as you're already familiar, it's the volatility, the up and down, back and forth, not knowing from one day to the next where things are going. Uncertainty, vaccine, no vaccine, alpha variant, beta variant. Charlie variant, Delta variant, and beyond, right? Complexity, a lot of moving parts, logistics, travel, 
vaccination passports, ambiguity, what things mean, what is a passport. And so we're really operating in a condition where in my 42 years in the business, I've never seen before. I've made a study of all several prior crises, going back to when I started the business in the late 1970s and from now on, so about 42 years. And this has been the kind of the most uncertain time. And so part of, I guess, the the discussion today is what are some of the things that I want you to think about? I'm not here to tell you what to do. You're the experts. You're in the marketplace. You are the one that are facing the reality on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to maybe get you to think in a slightly different way than when you started and when you joined this uh, program at 7.30. So when you came in, you had a certain worldview. What I'm hoping in the next 45 minutes or so, I want to sort of shift that worldview just a little bit and get you to think about one or two things differently an hour from then, so at 8.30 your time, than when you started the seminar at 7.30. Bosco, if you advance the slide, just very briefly for 10 seconds, uh, I'm going to show you some of the companies that I both teach and learn from. So you'll recognize some of these brand names. Over the last 42 years, I've had the pleasure and privilege of not only teaching some of these companies, but also learning from them. So what I'm going to share with you today is sort of a 45-minute a version of accumulated wisdom over 42 years. We're going to squeeze it all in about 40, 45 minutes. And so I like to say, you know, I learn to teach, but I also teach to learn. And so when I go to work with some of these companies, I get a lot of insight from them. I will bring some of those insights to bear as you recognize multiple continents and multiple price points. All right, if you can move to the next one. So a quick three-part goal in the 45 minutes or so we have together. Goal number one is for me to lay out just some things that I'm seeing that you should be paying attention to. If you're already paying attention to it, you should be paying more attention to it. If you're paying more attention to it, you should be paying attention to it in a different way. So let's see if I can either get you to pay attention, get you to pay more attention, or get you to pay attention in slightly different forms. That's goal number one. Number two is to talk about the impact that these trends are having on our business, how it's affecting the way people operate. So that's number two. And number three is to both, from my experience with some of these companies and my travels and my research around the world, is discuss how companies, as well as you, the participants, and I'm hoping uh, you'll contribute and share some of your thoughts and ideas. I know we have a few general managers lined up uh, to uh, kind of jump in uh, with their examples or their challenges or opportunities. Uh, and uh, Mr. Mohan Kumar will identify them shortly. Uh, we have comprised what we call an expert panel, people that are stepped up to say, we want to share what's happening in our marketplace. And hopefully that'll be a lesson to uh, everybody. And again, the words that I'm sure you're hearing all the time. I remember I was on a panel discussion with Fiki a few months ago, and I think it was somebody from the Department of Tourism that said our mantra today is survive, revive, and thrive. And I thought I would put that up in the, in the goal setting. Very good. So let's go to the next slide. So, you know, Charles Dickens said in the Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, it's very hard for us to think about the best of times. I was going to say it's the worst of times and even worst of times. And so, but the framework I want you to keep in mind is we lost the presentation. So if you want to just go back into presentation mode, whoever's doing the PowerPoint. So what I want to bring is a little bit of wisdom from our neighbors to the north and to the east uh, from China that Chinese philosophers thousands of years ago told us that one of the ways to deal with life is to recognize that you'll very often come across these two characters. And if anybody in the audience either reads or writes Chinese, you can tell me what these characters are. Uh, Mr. Mohan, if you will monitor the chat and see if somebody can decipher these. If not, yeah, I'll see. Yeah. Anybody Does that look familiar? So this is the Chinese word for crisis. And as my Chinese friends explained to me, that Chinese language, written language, isn't like English or Hindi or French. It doesn't have alphabets or, or letters. It has characters. And each character is a pictorial representation of an object or a feeling or a theme. There are simple words, one character, one meaning. There are complex words, two characters equals one word equals one meaning. 
So this is the Chinese word for crisis, and it has two parts, the top part and the bottom part, as you will see. I, I'm going to use my, my cursor here. So, so may, I, may I attempt to say that? Yes. Hing Yan, right? What's that? Hing Yan, right? Inga, is that what it is? Yes. So if you think about crisis, and this is a this is a question for the audience, when you think of the word crisis, what is the first word that comes to your mind? What's the first synonym? The first word that has the same meaning? Anybody? Oh, jump in your chat. I'm sure there are some people whose fingers are flying over the keyboard. Mr. Monkwa, you have to tell me if somebody... Yeah, I'm, I'm tracking it. I'm tracking it. Okay. What are they saying? Uh, yeah, well... Uh, they're all saying they're all in the mood of saying good morning to everyone. So, yeah. uh, you know, I think they're moving up. Go yeah. ahead, Professor. Yeah. What what word comes to mind when you think of the word crisis? Right. You might say threat or danger. Well, they are saying uh, complexity, uh, ambiguity, opportunity, uncertainty, volatile. You know those. Very. Those good. Words Very. Using, yeah. Yeah. However, there's the second part of the bottom that also has its own meaning. So while the top part of the word signifies danger, the bottom part signifies, drum roll here, if it's not danger, it must be, anybody? Second part, if you think of the word crisis, two parts that make all. Somebody write it. Go ahead, I missed that. Unpredictable? No, keep going. Um. We lost the presentation mode. Somebody, can you go back yeah. to presentation mode? Yeah, let me see if there's one, anyone yeah. coming in at the chat box. Uh, uh, if, the, if the first one signifies threat or danger, the second word or second symbol signifies opportunity. Opportunity. Very good. So here's the takeaway, and that is you have to believe that in every crisis is buried an opportunity. And so for me, the people that are going to survive revive and thrive are the ones that are going to see opportunity in this crisis. I know it seems very hard at this point to think of anything positive coming out of this. And yet, if you think about some of the most interesting innovation that have happened in our business in the last 12 to 18 months, it's because people have been faced with these impossible situations and have come up with some new answers. So let's advance the slides and go to the, the list. Yeah, keep going. Let's go to the list of 10. Let's go to the first one. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share with you 10 crises that I want you to be more aware of, more aware of, think of in a different way that creates the context for you to turn this into an opportunity and to think about capitalizing on the opportunity maybe with some innovations. So I'm going to lay out 10 things that I tell, and by the way, just as a little sort of side note, when I teach in the general managers program, and we did our first virtual one earlier this year, usually it's in person. This is the framework I spend 12 hours with the GM, and I'm only spending less than an hour with you, but this is the framework I use for my discussion with GMs that come to Cornell from all over the world. So you're getting sort of a sneak preview as to what I do uh, with the GM's program. All right, so let's advance the slides. Let's see if I can do this in about 10 or 10, 12 minutes. So part of the crisis today is changing customer profile. And that is asking yourself demographically, psychographically, in terms of lifestyles and behaviors, what are some of the new ways in which people are expressing themselves? What are some of the new customers? You know, we talk about in the West or in the US about, you know, baby boomers, and we talk about generation Y and generation Z and Z millennials is, Think about all the people that are either entering the travel marketplace or expressing themselves in the marketplace. Uh, Mr. Monkar has come out and mentioned to me that even some of the luxury hotels in Indian locations are getting people to their hotels that would never have stayed there before. But because of the low rates, because of new opportunities, people are showing up. And so part of the challenge today is to realize that the customer of yesterday is not going to be the same as a customer of tomorrow. Now, these are these were ongoing trends before COVID hit, but these trends have just been amplified and magnified. So many, many businesses I know today are dealing with customers they've never seen before. I'll give you a quick personal example. I am part owner of a resort in Florida, and it's a it's a condominium share. So as you know, everybody's got a got a little a share of it. And we decided earlier this year, at least the board decided to drop their rates dramatically 
And we got a whole new set of customers that we didn't know how to deal with. And they were behaving in different ways. It was not customers we'd been used to. So it took a while for the, for the business to adapt itself to the reality of this new customer. And so question you have to ask yourself is, how is my customer profile in the coming weeks and months going to change? How is it changing today? And what do I have to do differently? Because if you did it the same way previously, there's going to be an obvious mismatch between what you have offered and the customer. So this changing customer profile is was an ongoing trend, but it's just been accelerated. If you can go to number two. The second part of this second trend I see is shifting consumption patterns and changes in customer or buyer behavior, how customers live, work, play, and travel. For instance, you hear, you hear of workation, staycations, daycations, you make up your term, there's a new one every day, right? Work from home, WFH, work from hotel. People are behaving in ways, given the pandemic, that they didn't do prior, previously. And part of your job as successful leaders is how do you adapt yourself to understanding how people's behavior patterns are changing? You know, CEOs of the largest companies have, have announced that one of the biggest growth in their markets is people combining business and pleasure. They call them leisure, right? Business and leisure is when people are there for a business trip or a conference, but they also have a significant amount of time devoted to leisure. How does that work? How do you adapt yourself to make sure that the two purposes that the people are there for are suitable? The other thing is, you know, in uncertain times, and this is this is uh, brain science, this is consumer behavior, this is psychology going back many decades, is the one thing we look for is control. So today, your customers are more desirous of control than ever before. They want to move the locus of control away from you, the operator, towards me, the consumer. I'll give you a little short story. So a psychology researcher had a burning question, and the question was, how much electricity can the human body withstand? So he puts some subjects in a chair, cranks up the electricity, and says to them, when it gets too much, just yell, stop, and I'll record it. And he does it 50 times, and he records it, and he does a little graph, and mean medium mode, and he says, okay, so, um, you know, the average human body can withstand X amount of electric shock. He does the same thing again with the same subject profile, same chair, same day of the week, same week of the month, and this time he gives all the participants a little red button and says to them, you know, I'm going to give you this button, and when the shock gets too much, just press the button and the thing will turn off, and he runs the experiment again. Well, when he runs the experiment a second time, he finds that the human body's ability to withstand electricity goes up significantly in the second sample, in the second group. So question for the audience in the chat, what changed from the first group to the second group? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm getting into it and checking. Wonderful. Um, let's see who's fast on the trigger. Okay, um, anybody? What changed in the second instance, the second experiment? You didn't expect too many questions this early in the morning, I think. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah. What did the red button do? Yeah, Kenneth is saying control. Manu. Yes, very good. Give him some credit. So good, good answer. Well, so, he, he's one of the gold medalists of uh, the Bombay Catering College and a great manager. Wonderful. So think about let's let's get away from the world of electric chairs to the world of business. So you give customers control. The following things happen: complaints go down. Now. It's not to say complaints are a bad thing. Complaints can be very educational, very instructive. It's the ones you don't want, the bad complaints, right? The ones you want to do without, they go down. Satisfaction goes up. Intent to return goes up. Intent to refer goes up. And price sensitivity comes down. So think of the four or five magic metrics by which you measure your success. Complaints, satisfaction, intent to return, intent to refer, and price elasticity or sensitivity all moving in the right direction only because you move the locus of control. But that's scary to do. I was a little personal story I was talking to my wife the other day. He said, we were coming back from dinner and I said, oh, we were going to dinner. And I said, you know, it would be really helpful if I could know for every restaurant in my market where I am now, I could look and see what is the occupancy for tonight? How long can I expect to wait? Or, you know, my service, will it be slow? Can I look at the map? Can I look at the seat map of the restaurant and know, you know, right now at the eight o'clock seating, 
90% of the tables are occupied or 20% of the tables are occupied because then I can know, you know, how much time, how, how patient will have to be, you know, maybe the kitchen is a little bit backed up. And I said to her, this is interesting because she said, oh, that'd be crazy, right? I've never seen that before. And I said, well, think about this. When I'm booking my airline ticket, I can look at my seat map. And when I'm picking my seat, I know exactly how many people are on the plane, right? An 80 seater, I know 68 seats are booked. I know I got 12 seats left to go. I can know where the seats are. I can pick my seat. So I'm giving you somewhat of a, a crazy example, but I'm thinking how we have to think about ways in which we can, within reason, move the locus of control, especially because in uncertain times, our customers are seeking control. How do we do this in a smart way? Because if we do it, we draw the customer and we win. Something to think about. All right, let's go to number three. So competition, right? So I would ask my Cornell students, every year I ask them the same question. Yeah. If you're a hotel and you have your uh, a new person entering your market, how would they measure success? And they'll say things like, well, it's occupancy, it's rate, it's how many mentions in social media, it's satisfaction, it's repeat business, all the great, they, all the great metrics to measure competitive success. And then I push them and I push them and say, there is one other thing that you're not mentioning that is burned on the brains of every single hotel manager entering every single market today, at least the smart ones. And you won't find this in any business plan, any marketing plan, but it is burned on the brains of all the people on the opening team. And the very singular objective is how many existing competitors, in, we call them incumbents, people already in the market, how many existing hotels can I put out of business as quickly as possible? Now that might sound like a little rough and a little aspirational, but if it isn't, if that isn't your motivation, if that isn't what's gonna wake you up in the morning and get you going, then you're not doing your job. Because if you aren't gonna to try to put them out of business, then they're surely gonna to try to put you out of business. So when I advised the owner of the Four Seasons in Mumbai and I said, you know, there's a former student of mine and I said, uh, Mr. Jati, I said, you know, you've got a one year before you open, you have to start getting the list of the most valuable customers of all the luxury hotels in Mumbai. And you got to pick them off one by one. Goldman Sachs, IBM, you know, all the big companies, Tata's, whoever is using the, the hotels at the highest level, you got to pick them off one by one. Because by the time you open, they should be lying up your door, not at their door. That's the nature of the business. So the point there is that we know competition is a is very much here and it's an ongoing issue. I think we're moving into, especially in tough times, you have to be prepared to deal with what we call, I'm calling hyper competition, is really competitors that are coming for your business in a very new and interesting and aggressive way. And unless you're prepared for that, it's gonna to be tough to, uh, to win. Let's go to number four. Yeah, Professor, I just want to say something about the third intensifying competition. Am yes, I? Please. Yes, please. Uh, you know, and this is something that's probably peculiar to India, uh, especially being a large demography of young youngsters. Work from home has actually created a new wave of businesses, opportunities, which is non-conventional. So you have this home delivery business, you have the cloud kitchens, you have a whole lot of things which were unthinkable in terms of the scale let's say a couple, uh, before the pandemic. So that's that's one of the new animals that are come into this hospitality. Wonderful. Now, thank you for bringing that up because I'm gonna come back to that in a, in a few minutes. All right, let's go to number four. So part of the challenge we face as an industry is realizing that the way we categorize business is kind of outmoded. So if you think back to 100 years ago, you know, we've always thought about individual business, group business, business travel, leisure travel. Right? It's kind of what I call a two by two. And yet there are opportunities today to completely reimagine the marketplace and reimagine the groups within the marketplace. American Express did a study a few years ago where they went to the marketplace with you know zero based start and said, if we had to completely from scratch define our markets, what would they be? And they came up with some very interesting, you can, uh, you can Google this. It's under the program Nextpedition, which is a very clever combination of the words next and expedition, Nextpedition. And they created these segments, these groups of people that were very clearly identified in very different and interesting ways 
than we've done so previously. So part of you is go back and ask yourself the question, is there a different way of categorizing our customers? Because if there is, then you get there first, you get to think about ways to reach them first, and you get things, you get to bring them in your uh, business in a new and interesting way. So think about, can we get out of the sort of the standard way of defining markets and think of new ways for which why people buy, when they buy, how they buy, with whom they buy, so that we can kind of reorganize our our marketing investments and outreach investments in new and interesting ways so you can allocate the right amount of investment to the right market, right? So there's an opportunity buried. It's a crisis because everything is sort of up in the air. People are behaving in sort of strange ways. The, the traditional models no longer apply. The new models are slowly revealing themselves, but as they do, your job is to sort of figure out where's the market moving, how are the new subgroups organizing themselves, and what is the best way to reach them? All right, let's go to number five. And I promise you there'll be time for questions. So one of the biggest challenges that's always faced business that has just been accelerated in the pandemic for both external reasons and internal reasons, I'll explain what I mean in a second, is this what I call the commoditization trap. So think of the three forces working against you. You have OTAs or OTCs as sometimes they're called that are convincing travelers that a room is a room is a room. Whether it's my friend Deep Cholera from Make My Trip or people from Expedia or Booking, which hires a lot of our students. Remember the OTA's job is to convince the consumer a room is a room is a room and the only thing that matters is price. Mm -hmm. right? The problem there is it becomes all homogenized. So that's one. The second thing is if you think about, you know, the fact that the, the classic response of most hoteliers to any crisis is to lower the rate. Well, when you lower the rate, what you're saying is effectively to the marketplace, a room is a room is a room, and the lowest price wins, right? Which is, as you know, is what we call the doom loop, right? It's a it's a, a beginning of the of the death spiral. So part of the job of any smart leader today is thinking about how do I continue to effectively, meaningfully, substantially, and sustainably differentiate myself from the competition? How can I be truly different so that people are not looking for price, they're looking for that point of difference. You know, if you're in the South Pacific or in Maldives and you have an overwater bungalow, the, there are resorts that have the overwater bungalow and there are resorts that don't have the overwater bungalow. And if you want to stay in an overwater bungalow, well, if you've stayed in one of those, you've seen pictures of it, it's kind of a unique experience. That's a very differentiated experience than a standard resort. I'm just giving you one trivial example, but the the stress has to be not so much, can I be the cheapest offer on the market, but how can I be the most meaningfully different option? Mm -hmm. So when somebody comes to my marketplace, they say, you know what? Everybody else is a commodity. They come to me for a unique reason. So the other day I was having a little conversation with a group of people. One of them happened to be from Morocco. And he said, you know, all the luxury hotels in Morocco, the Mamounia and Marrakesh, the Oberoi, the Four Seasons, the top tier is doing really well which is sort of interesting even in pandemic times, only because they've each been able to differentiate themselves substantially from all the others to say, we have something nobody else has. And so in order to get it, you have to come to me and nobody else can offer the same thing, which means price is become secondary as opposed to primary. So this, this idea of breaking out of this dwindling differentiation and really striving for this point of difference and breaking out of the commodity trap is going to be a continue. It is as much today, a struggle is going to be a continuing struggle. Can you give people a meaningful reason to come to where you are? All right, let's go to number six. Number six has to do with diminishing brand loyalty. So as much as whether it's an independent hotel brand or a multi-unit hotel brand, no matter how much money they spend, how much money they try, because of something I mentioned to you previously, surveys after survey have shown us that people's affinity to brands is declining and there's a struggle not all brands but generally speaking you know when you have choices like airbnb you have a lot of independence you have online travel agents saying a room is a room is a room it's no surprise that it's a struggle today to maintain brand loyalty and i will tell you if there's one kind of key takeaway message from this whole session for you it's whether you're an independent single unit operation or your multi-unit, multi-unit brand, multiple locations, is really focusing on working on your brand and making sure people have a reason to want your brand. 
And I also have a little secret acronym that I'll share with you, and then maybe I'll do it now. And that is, if you want to write this down, it might be helpful to say, what I teach my students at Cornell is becoming a great brand, there are five secrets to doing that. And that will be kind of a takeaway from item six, and that is, it really spells the word brand. So what's, what are the five elements? The first one is be brave, be bold. You have to stand out in a, in a crowded, commoditized marketplace, right? That's the first one is make sure whatever you're saying, whatever, whether it's lemon tree talking about how it's hiring people that are disadvantaged, whether it's, uh, you know, the Velas properties at Oberoi talking about spectacular locations. In some way, the brand has to be bold and brave and stand out from the rest of the crowd, whether it's IC talking about it's, in my metal conservation, you know, the double and triple bottom line that they've been talking about for many years is taking a brave stand as a brand. So that's B for bold. R is for relevant, is how can it be more relevant to your customers' needs, wishes, desires, requirements tomorrow than you were yesterday? I often say to people when you're, walk, when you're checking guests into the room and the guest says to you, so what's new? That's not an idle question. It's a real question as in what is new? What have you done since the last time I was here to raise my pleasure coefficient and lower my pain coefficient? Faster check-in, you know, smoother process, less time. So B is for bold, R is for relevant, A is for authentic. Be something that's yourself, that's natural, that's organic, that really represents who you are and not something you're trying to be. The N is novel. People like something that's new, that's unique that's different right so novelty clearly as a we own a premium so novelty is a premium and then d is distinct is how can you say that you're any different from anybody else in a meaningful way we have uh my former student and colleague mr vijay want you on the call runs the imperial i'm a big fan go with uncle the owner was a student of mine you know there isn't any other hotel in New Delhi that sort of matches that profile. If you want that kind of place, then the only place to go to is an Imperial. Okay, with no disrespect to my friends at Lila, you know, the Lila Palace, which I've also stayed at a beautiful hotel, but the Imperial is always going to be the Imperial, right? So in that sense, <laughs> some sort of a distinction that you have that unique place in the marketplace that, that gives you a point of difference. So keep those kind of five things in mind as you think about point six. Let's go to number seven. Uh, that's a, one of the most significant things that you said, uh, Professor. Could you just re repeat that brand again? Because a lot of yeah. them probably would have missed out writing it. There you go. Very quick. B is for bold. R is for relevant. A is for authentic. N is for novel. And D is for distinct. If you can achieve Thanks. these five pillars, then you've got yourself the beginnings of a great offering. Let's go to number seven, value orientation. So one of the challenges in crisis times and a resistance to try to not drop your prices, maintain price integrity is something we talk about, is the notion of value. And very often value and price are conflated. And it, I will say almost at every level in the marketplace, price is only one component of value. And so I would rather have you, instead of lowering your price, is add some things to the package to enhance the value instead of lowering price. What you've done is you can increase value by lowering price, but you can also increase value by holding price and inc right. increasing the value proposition by adding some amenities and services. So when I was talking to the folks in Dubai, I said to the Ritz-Carlton, who was in Burj Al Arab, I said, you know, when I come to stay at the Ritz-Carlton at the Burj Al Arab and I come with my family, my children want to have the key to the top floor. That's it. If you can get me the keys to the top floor of the building so I can stand on the 108th floor of the Burj Al Arab and get a view, bird's eye view of Dubai, that's amazing. I will pay a premium for that offer. So it's asking the question, how can you reconfigure your value proposition so not only do you have to fight the market in terms of trying to get customers, but you offer the value proposition that people are saying, you know, I'll give you another quick example. So we have a a resort in Pennsylvania called the Great Wolf Lodge, and they were trying to get a uh, schoolcation business, parents that were teaching their children home and saying to them, you know what, why don't you come to the resort? We'll conduct, we'll arrange for you to have classes, your students to take, your children take class at the resort. We will create the position of a chief learning officer. So we will have somebody on staff who will help 
children who are in school but have to do the school from remote locations, but we'll set it up so you can actually do your school at the resort for a certain number of hours a day, and then the rest of the time you can play. So just examples of how think about your value proposition. You know, my uh, former uh, student, Yash Malhotra from Cornell, who runs a restaurant and a hotel in Kanpur, said to me, you know, we had limitations on how many people we could get on a restaurant. So what do we do? We created a driving experience. It's the restaurant is called Duan. If you ever go to Kanpur, you may want to check it out. So you have people driving up and like the old drive-in movie experience, you get your food delivered in a tray in a very nicely done way at your car. And you're out there, you're in your car in a private space. It's safe and secure. You know, another one of my high school classmates who runs, you should run Kuali in Mumbai, said to me, we try to create new value propositions on the sidewalk, the pavement outside, because we couldn't have people inside the hotel. So we had this really cool bubbles that people were served in. So thinking about value propositions, I think is a great opportunity in this crisis. Let's go to number eight. So this is never gonna go away. Uh, the one good news, you know, uh, people were wonderfully pleased to see beautiful pictures of India Gate when the COVID thing happened, you know, blue sky, they showed that the month before, two months before you saw all kind of cloudy, you couldn't see India Gate on a, on a on the middle of the day and then everything sort of cleared up. People are showing pictures of Kanchanjunga from Darjeeling. You could see the mountains for the first time. So the one kind of benefit was that we realized that we could be doing a lot less. We could be doing a lot of things much more smartly. So we're not killing ourselves and killing the planet. And so this has only been accelerated by the, by the pandemic is how can you as a business do a much better job being better stewards of the environment. That's not, not gonna go away. I think it's just been amplified the more we hear about plastic and plastic waste. And so my personal mission has been to convince hoteliers to get rid of the little shampoo and conditioner bottles in the room, yeah. either have dispensers or even yeah. better, encourage people to travel with their own shampoo and conditioner. And by the way, if you tell people they'll do it, they have them at home, everybody has their favorite. And if not, either have a vending machine on the floor or even at the front desk to say, the reservation request, you want us to put in your room, let us know, we'll put it in. If you don't hear from you, you bring your own. If you forget, we can give it to you in a vending machine on the floor, or we'll have it at the front desk and you can come get it for free. Just by doing that, if you lower 10 to 20% usage, imagine the millions and millions and millions of bottles. I just give you one trivial example, but I think the pressure is on us now to treat this crisis as an opportunity and say, what can we do different, what can we do better? Let's go to number nine. Okay, so one of the things we're seeing happening, and it's only been accelerated with the pandemic, is, and this is just beginning, you may have heard that SH Hotels and uh, Blackstone Board Extended Stay America, other big, large companies are either creating additional brands or they're buying up brands, consolidating. So the large, the big ones are getting bigger. As you know, Airbnb is getting bigger every day. So part of the challenge is, you're going to be much more consolidated tomorrow than you were yesterday, partially as a lot of the pandemic, a lot of buying and selling. You guys have heard what's happened with Hyatt in Mumbai. You know, I got the letter. I saw the letter that went out to all the employees saying hotels closed, all 3,000 people are laid off. So in turmoil times, there are going to be some buying and selling. There's going to be some consolidation. And so if you're on your own, you have to ask yourself, what can I do? To, to challenge or battle with increasingly large competitors, and that's gonna get much harder. If you're part of the large company, you have to ask yourself, what can I do within my large company to make sure I get the oxygen I need? Because it, very often it's very easy as a hotel or as a brand in a large company to get lost and not get the resources you need, and especially in tough times. And they say, sorry, you know, no budget for CapEx, and yet that's what you need to try to maintain your position. So in a, in a consolidating marketplace, the crisis is, all bets are off. The opportunity is how do you make a case for making sure that you preserve and enhance your position? That's number nine. Let's go to number 10. So of course, we can't finish the conversation without talking about the power of digital. So McKinsey calls it doubling down on digital. Nice, nice little alliteration. And that is, I was listening to somebody the other day from IBM in, on a panel I was in, and he was telling me that you know before the pandemic, 
roughly 70%, 70 to 80% of airline customers that downloaded an airline app, the number for hotels was roughly between 20 and 25%. So we're not a very digitally forward business. We don't have very digitally engaged customers. We're still doing things sort of the old fashioned way. Yeah. Part of the challenge of the crisis today is how do we double down on digital? How do we make sure that we correctly balance high tech and high touch? I was on, as I said, I was on panel a week ago and I asked, and there were some technologists on the panel and I said to them, so is the high tech, high touch balance adjusting? Are we becoming more high tech instead of high touch? You know, we're always known to be a high touch business. And I will tell you that nobody actually said this, but as they kept telling me about instances where there was automation, technology, more use of technology, my light bulb moment was when I realized, you know what? It's not an either or. High tech is the new high touch. Yeah. How can you figure out a way to meaningfully connect with your guests at the right moment with the right solution, but instead of doing it with a person, do it way more efficiently and more, way more ease of use with some technology. So I think looking at that mix, looking at that balance, looking at that kind of the, when do you use the person and when do you use technology is undergoing a huge amount of change. The technology companies are here to help you. They would like a, a get a bigger piece of our industry, of course. But the idea is that there are opportunities here to sort of completely reimagine the guest experience by thinking about the, the right balance between high tech and high touch that has been forced on us by the pandemic. Let me go to the next slide and leave you with kind of a final thought and we'll open up for a few questions. And I thought you might enjoy this. It's kind of a travel, a travel related uh, within the travel context. So my final word on this topic is a bend on the road is not necessarily the end of the road. Right now we're many bends on the road unless you fail to make the turn. So the road is gonna get a lot windier ahead. We don't know third way, fourth way, fifth way, where this thing is going. And so all I can tell you is get your hands on that steering wheel, make sure your windshield is clean, make sure your lights are on and full full battery and just get ready to make those turns because it's going to get a lot curvier up ahead. And those of you that make the turn successfully are the ones that are gonna go over the finish line. Let me stop there and uh, see if there are any questions, comments. We have about 10 minutes to go. I'll stay a few minutes longer if I need to. But I just wanted to give you sort of a, a, sort of a big picture view Again, without telling you in specific cities in India or resorts what you should be doing, just a way to think about the business in maybe some new and interesting ways so that this is the time to do it. This is the time to, to rethink, to reimagine, because the good news is your customers, your employees, and yes, even your owners, because everybody's running scared, they'll be a lot more forgiving if you try some things. Not all the things you're going to try are going to work, but if you try some things and they work, and you get a breakthrough moment, then this is the time to do it. Because right now, while it's a dangerous, uncertain, fluid marketplace, it's also a marketplace that says, you know, we'll give you we'll give you points for trying. Professor, you know, uh, we're just mesmerized. <laughs> well, I'm absolutely you. mesmerized. Why you talk yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, this is, uh, you know, what comes to my mind, this is Professor Dave's Ten Commandments. There you go. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you so much. My God. Uh, it's not just pearls of wisdom. It's oyster pearls of wisdom. Thank you. Honestly. I'm you know, I, I'm, uh, because I'm in the industry for the, now for 45 years. And I've always been um, you know, a follower and fan of yours. And uh, now today, after about... 15, 20 years, uh, you know, I'm again listening to you live. So thank you so much. And I know there's been a lot of um, thought process that has gone into this uh, slides. So we'll just, there'll be a lot to discuss uh, because I can see the chat box is very busy. So let me just do a little bit of recognition and honoring of the participants who are around, Professor. Terrific. And, uh, also, Mr. Mokumar, so what, about the, what about what are you calling our export panel, the GMs? Maybe give them yeah, a I'm going to do that. Yes. Yeah. Great. All, in, all in a few seconds. Wonderful. Yeah. So I just first, first of all, I want to recognize and acknowledge, uh, you know, this awesome presentation that you have uh, shared with us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. And uh, you. more importantly, you know, how generous of you, uh, uh, you know, uh, to have spent time and also recognize so seriously and come in with something that is very contextual to our 
uh, our situation here and we need india needs more of you honestly i'm happy to do whatever thank i can you. i say this with the bottom of my heart yeah. thank you so much and uh, may god bless you thank you so i just want to recognize uh, some of the colleagues who have already come in uh, uh, you know they already here uh, uh, some of my uh, uh, industry colleagues um, you know grish uh, bindra then there is ramesh takulia all of them you know both are uh, you know from the north of india uh, delhi based uh, ramesh uh, of course been a long term colleague of mine and again he is a guru of hotel management education in india uh, girish of course is uh, the president of the scout club in delhi and a very active hotelier in delhi thank you so much for joining us then we have manoj matthew one of the dynamic uh, former general managers of the taj group and now he is taken over even before he retired he got this job as the vice president of uh, tamara leisure resorts which is upcoming superstar uh, brand in india all luxury properties in uh, so far now in south uh, then of course we have anand rao another veteran from the itc group uh, anand thank you so much he is my contemporary we have fought the battle in the com in the market but we are great friends and that's the way it should be um, Uh, Shinoj Matthew, another young upcoming uh, superstar. Uh, thank you, Shinoj, for being here. Ajay Sambige, again from the Royal Orchid Hotels, and Suresh Badlani is another legend of hotel of hospitality industry in India. Thank you so much, Suresh. It's always a pleasure to have you here, and you know the spirit is very much there. You see, have the range of uh, uh, you know profiles of people attending this uh, thing, right from a twenty-year-old up to seventy years or sixty-five plus, definitely. senior citizens but they are all gurus and past masters of hospitality industry i would love and to hear from some of them yes i would love to hear from some of them just some yes i'm bringing them yeah so sure. definitely and then we have ruben kataria he is another uh, you know superstar in the hospitality industry he was in form, uh, formerly in marriotts and now with the leela group here in bangalore uh, thank you ruben and he is coming in as one of the participants in our uh, inter interactive discussions uh then okay so, and then a whole lot of them i just want to also acknowledge uh, those who have done the chat box here it's been buzzing so you have uh, uh, manoj matthew uh, nikhil sarosh kathap is asked a very qu uh, pertinent question uh, professor price is a function of demand and supply and holiday play with rates um, to maximize revenues so if you don't reduce price then it defeats the purpose of revenue management as a function uh well i'm just only reading out loud we're not getting into the session right now uh, uh sherik kurin has also been uh, active uh, so is ks narayan new and this control button was pressed by a lot of them and, and i just mentioned only kenneth pinto but there are a whole lot of you know uh, bright guys around who are uh, sharp on their trigger button uh, on getting in to the answers ajay sambige kk pant dilip kumar shivdas matthew thomas ramesh takulia Ruben Kataria, of course, also said adaptation for the Jacob, Kenneth Pindo, Manoj Matthew, Ramesh Takulia, and, and then you have uh, Shri Gandhana, Shri, Shri, Shri Lakshmi Nair, Manish Jain, Kenneth Pindo, Rekha, Miranda, Manish Jain again, once again Vishnu, and uh, then you have um, Girish, Shinoj. Uh, so you know, a whole lot of them have actually been very active in the bus. Thank you. We are greatly encouraged. So now we didn't do. Do you want me to try to address some of those points? Did you yeah, please wait? go ahead. Go ahead, sir. When did you, you want the PMs and others to speak? Did you want them to speak first? Please go ahead, sir. Okay. So let me take Sarosh's question first. You know, Sarosh, you make a very interesting point about price, and clearly, what I meant to say is, you know, we often lead with price, and the point I'm making here is, I want you to lead with value. Of course. price is going to be if you think of the four arrows in your quiver right you're bringing out each of the four arrows and think of sort of the classic four p's of marketing what i often see is that price is the first one you think you give away my urge to you is price should be the last thing you give away here i'll give you a little another kind of a mind bending example so i had a former student of mine that came to me many years after graduating from school and he showed me his business card and he said i'm very pleased to tell you that i've now become the director of revenue management of a very big hotel and i said to him well that's congratulations that's great but you need to first of all burn your card or recycle your card because your title is already out of date what you should be doing is not revenue management not even revenue maximization 
but you should be doing profit maximization. Your job should be director of profit maximization. And so sometimes that means holding price, but increasing your value by giving giveaway product, open a channel, start a new marketing initiative, spend money to make money yeah. and use price. Because you know, that $1, the, the 100 rupees you give away, you've given away forever. So it's not that you don't use price, it's just that unlike a lot of revenue management thinking, instead of price being the primary level that you push, I want that to be the fourth lever, hold it. At the very end, of course, if you have to move it, you have to move it. So that's what I'd say about that. Somebody else had a question. Let me just go in order here. How do I get to the top of this? Oh, I go to... Uh, May oh. I request one thing, Professor? Yes. There are lots of them coming in. So yeah. we can have, we have a dedicated session for that at the end of the inter after the interactive session. Great. Uh, okay. uh, thank you so much. Uh, so let's get moving straight into that interactive session. So we have uh, uh, lined up. Uh, as you had suggested, recommended, and I learned a lot from you yesterday in this, uh, you know, pre-test uh, um, uh, insights from you. So, sorry for all the trouble. Sorry for all the trouble I gave you yesterday. Uh, not at all. It's been a pleasure. Every moment is actually a golden opportunity to learn more. Um, so I would like to invite Ruben Kataria, uh, Manoj Matthew is Vijay Banchu if he's there, uh, and uh, maybe uh, one or two others who are willing to come in. Can uh, we in can we get them to unmute their video? So we can see yes, them? Yes, yes. Uh, we have a control. So I will tell Baska and Syed, uh, if you could actually identify, um, you know, uh, Ruben, Ruben Kataria, Manoj Matthew, Vijay Wanchu of Girish, Girish, Ramesh Takulia, and Kenneth Pindo, if you if you wish to come in. Okay. So these are all thinkers and thought leaders. Uh, of course, uh, with due respect to a lot of others, we're all equally yeah. there, but uh, time is, of course, obviously a constraint. Uh, but we are, we're going to give uh, each one of you a chance to interact. We are about nearly after this session of interactive session where we have uh, 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 lined up certain topics. We'll have an open session of chat with Professor Dave. Okay, so are you ready, Baska? Are they coming in? They need, so they need to press that speak option at the bottom of the right hand screen and uh, then maybe we can give them some yeah. access. Go ahead, go ahead and guide them quickly. Seconds are moving in. Ruben, come in please. Can we, can we have the gallery mode? Uh, possibly that's, that's how we can see each other, right? Baska. So, uh, okay. Ruben, uh, Mr. Ruben Kataria is requesting to speak. Yeah, no, go ahead. Let me first actually unmute him video and audio. I'll Sir. be the moderator. So, I'll start with the initiate the interactive discussion. Okay. Sir, so, he will uh, not be able to come on video. Okay, go ahead, uh, Ruben. Go ahead. You know, uh, let me just tell you the topics. So, it's post pandemic reopening scenario, adopt strategy based on survive, revive, and thrive. Focus on maximizing yield to capture every potential leads. Innovate and build agility. That's important. And I, I know the industry very well. I know the leaderships and out there how the Indian uh, you know, corporate work culture is. I've been part of that uh, in one of the best brands in India. So uh, therefore, how, what are the kind of changes that we have to bring in you know, consciously? So that's adopt strategy. Uh, focus on maximizing yield to capture every potential lead. And also cut all the bureaucracy, bring the frontliners and the general managers, give them all the powers to go in and capture every single opportunity of business. Innovate and build agility, restructure, re-engineer, reimagine, price, value, margin formula, decentralize to empower all customer contact associates, all, I mean, even the housekeeping boy or a porch guard. Everyone should become a touch point salesperson to bring business leads and make sure that he's honored and it, that's captured seriously. And then some, somebody, somebody should get back to the person concerned who was given the lead that, okay, here, here, this is what's happened. Introduce incentive culture to boost extraordinary performance, incentive culture for superstars, reinforce and harness, it's not just a fixed salary, but a performance uh, based incentive uh, has to be at least about 40%. Uh, introduce incentive culture, yeah. reinforce and harness technology, as professor said very clearly, 
as an enabler to in create incremental revenue, optimize cost. That's what we have to do in the survival mode, where every day is a new strategy. Conversion from fixed to variable is the big elephant in the room. Secure, loyal, and new customer base. You have a huge new wave of customer base that's uh, available for you to grab. Uh, with specially designed individual customizing, for example, you know, the, 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 the weekend business from the families around, they want to drive into the city and stay in a, a beautiful uh, city in the city hotels and experience that whole luxury uh, feeling at a, at this affordable rate. So that that's a new wave uh, in my view, a new opportunity for a whole lot of city hotels to uh, develop that package. It's not, so it should not be just only for this pandemic phase. It has to be something that is to be consistent and uh, and predictable. Leadership to this is one uh, bold decisions for the greater good. That means if we have to actually sort of uh, sideline and take some uh, affirmative action on the perform the performers who are in the C category and give them some other replacement jobs, it, you need to do that because that's the way you can create a dynamic culture, a performing culture in the organizations. Right? You have to reward and incentivize the star performers you cannot actually treat all of them in the same scale truncate asset in tune with the demand like if it's a 200 room hotel if there's only 100 rooms in the first few months of demand then make sure that you actually have a closure policy of those 100 rooms and then concentrate on those 100 rooms every single room every day has to be occupied you know so it's all about yield management uh, restructure human resources and process for the present immediate short term mid term so it has to be very agile decisions that have been taken how do you maximize the potential and productivity of the individual employees Le last but certainly not the least is the corporate office the big guy the big honchos like some of us who have been in the uh, corporate office leadership to rewire it's not just enough with only just the mid uh, mid management or the operating uh, team or the uh, regional team or, or the uh, you know, uh, or the frontline team that have to be, uh, uh, um, you know, expected to change things. It has to start right from the top, the MD, the CEO, the chairman of the company, leadership to rewire, infuse dynamis dynamism into strategy to make the establishment flexible and agile and quick to pick up and run with changing trends in this volatile market. So that's it uh, from my side. So uh, Ruben, if you are ready, please come in. Okay, sustainable and responsible tourism. S sustainable and responsible tourism by default has come to the forefront. And we have uh, people with all kinds of stress coming to our properties. So it is no longer the domain of health, health and wellness resorts to look at these aspects. So I think there is a need to look at the services offered in a much more inclusive way now that the new world has brought in new challenges. That is as far as the guest is concerned. As far as the employees and the staff is concerned, I think the need to re redesign your services has brought in the task multitasking again to the forefront. And I think some basics, it's back to basics for most of the employees. And rather than skill sets to service your customers. So this challenge, I believe needs to be looked at by the uh, new age hotels and the resorts. All right, Manoj, thank you. That's an interesting uh, uh, insight from you. Uh, any specific question you'd like to ask Professor Dave? So my question to, is that my question to Professor Dave is, is that this brings us to the mood question of customer satisfaction. Is this not a relevant aspect that we need to look at in the present context? Thank you. That's a that's not only a great insight. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, we were discussing this in the prep yesterday that there are the one unspoken 
pandemic that nobody's talking enough about that you're beginning to see as hoteliers is people's mental anxiety. So there's financial anxiety, physical anxiety, but the mental anxiety. And to your point, it's not just about, you know, kids coming to the resort and attending school, but it's also about the stress that they're facing, the parents, the children. So no, you're absolutely correct, is that it's it's almost as if, at least for the short and medium term, every hotel has to have kind of a wellness component. You have to think about all of the aspects of physical, the mental, the spiritual. So no, I completely agree that that I think is a, going to be a critical piece going forward. In fact, I think the one the places that are differentiating themselves by offering those services are the ones that are getting more uptake. Even here in the US, the suburban and resort and r rural locations that are offering more than just in a room and a bed for the night is offering kind of a comprehensive set of services, both in terms of you know food, beverage, uh, lodging, but also wellness, I think are the ones that are winning. So no, I think that's a, that's a very valuable insight that trying to offer this extra piece that nobody is really talking about that much, but we know the guests are showing up not to be um, disrespectful, but they're showing up with a lot of baggage. And we need to understand that when they arrive at the resort, it's more than just looking for a traditional experience like we had uh, pre-pandemic. So no, you're absolutely right on the money. And I've talked to people in multiple, whether it's in Paris or Costa Rica or you know South Africa, we're seeing the same thing. It's people are looking for a much more comprehensive experience than just uh, in a room or a bed for the night. So thank you for the insight and thank you for the question. Uh, to Manoj, uh, you know, Manoj has been a very successful uh, general manager of many hotels. And so, that, and he's also been part, you know, he was involved in the setting up and launch of the world famous Taj Kumarakam, you know, in Kerala. Mm. So, and I realized that he was part of, uh, we, were, we worked together. So, uh, he comes in with a lot of experience and insights, and also he's very articulate. So, Manoj, uh, there's something that you used about back to basics, and I think that's true. So, uh, right, start from the general manager downward across the entire team. It has to be back to basics in terms of attention to detail. Absolutely. You know, uh, try and see that everything is absolutely perfect. See, in a that kind of scenario, uh, the threshold of tolerance is very low for the guests. So, therefore, they would expect everything to be absolutely perfect, be it the rooms, be it the housekeeping, be it the restaurant counter service, uh, and any form of uh, touch point uh, experiences that the guest has, it has to be there. So, therefore, it's a physical presence. So, who could drive this? So, let's get the general manager back on the lobby. Let's get the general manager, you know, meet every single arrival. Let the general manager's presence be there all across the property. I think, uh, and its engagement with the guests would actually, in a sense, uh, become an inspiration for the rest of the team. You know, I've always experienced that whenever I take a round, I'm around the place, there's a certain amount of energy that you bring in. The HODs come in, everyone. So there has to be a culture of more of shop for walk around culture than in, in terms of, you know, uh, being uh, in the offices and uh, uh, communication, uh, you know, uh, though, but ma administrative management culture. Because next three months, it's all hands on deck. So I agree with you. Thank you. Uh, Manoj, uh, Professor, over to you. Uh, please choose and you can respond. Let me pick up on a couple of questions. Sherry Korean asked a question about, you know, revenge travel. And I like to think of more as pent up travel and people are anxious. People are saved their money because they haven't spent the money on things that they were doing earlier. So you can expect a lot more. Uh, and you say good old days of hospitality. I'll give you a personal example. So we're having dinner yesterday and there's a, about 50 steps down from the main resort down to the waterfront restaurant. And as you climb down those 50 steps, there are lights. This is nighttime. So there are lights on the side of the steps, as you can imagine. Yeah. And as we were walking up the steps, my wife and I were counting how many light bulbs are on and how many light bulbs were fused. Yeah. And we were saying to your point, Mr. Bon Kumar, had the GM been doing the rounds or the duty manager, you would have known that of the, I don't know, 50 or so lights, 25 on either side, you know, maybe 10 of them were, there was no bulb in them. So paying attention to detail. And the reason I bring that up also is because when your customers are coming back in the marketplace, remember it's a lot of pent up demand, but there's also pent up demand with high expectations, no matter what price they're paying. So they're going to be very alert watching what you're doing. And to Mr. Mon Kumar's point, if you're not paying attention to the details, well, then you're not going to get that repeat business. 
All right, Sarosh uh, Khatib asked the point, you know, uh, you know, bed and breakfast, you've got to give people a breakfast rate, including the breakfast in the room. So, Rosh, my question is, you literally can now rethink this combination, this bundling of services by customer. So my question is, why just bed and breakfast? What about bed and tea? What about bed and dinner? What about bed and an excursion? Think about ways in which you can almost get an infinite number of combinations, depending on which customers and what their value proposition is. So asking the question, if I don't like to get up on holiday till 11 o'clock and I don't eat breakfast, then a bed and breakfast package for me is completely meaningless. What I would love to have is something else. You know, I would love a great afternoon tea to be included even at the same price as my continental breakfast. So thinking about ways in which you can sort of really bring together the different components of your value package with what the customer is looking for. I think that could be a much more interesting way of combining it as opposed to the one price. Something to think about. Uh, yes, sir. Dev, uh, may I do the role of reading out so that that it leaves you with the space to think? Okay. You know, uh, I, I know these you know, guys. what I'm doing is I'm actually going through a couple of these and maybe I'll try to combine them uh, okay. two or three at the okay. same time. So mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Let's see. So we talked about Sarosh. We, I addressed the question of the price. Nikhil, you asked the question, VUCA situation. You know, if if you think about if you summarize VUCA into one construct, it's about risk. So variability, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity creates risk. And what you're doing as a manager is you're managing risk. So how do you manage risk? You make sure to re-examine your distribution channel portfolio. Ask yourself the question, have I invested in the right number of channels with the right emphasis? Have I invested the right number of promotional channels? You have the right number of offerings. So can you, in fact, think about a way to manage your own risk so that you can come out of the VUCA situation stronger than when you got into it? Um, Matthew asked the question. Matthew Thomas asked the question, how long do you think come back to normal? You know, Matthew, it's very hard to tell. I don't have a, a magic crystal ball. But I will tell you that from everything I'm hearing and reading and analyzing, I'm thinking normal, normal. We talk about 2019 levels. We're looking at probably close to 2025, 24, 25. So it's going to be a while before we get back to those normal. Some are coming back faster. And the others, as you know, long haul travel, you know, business travel will come back before business groups. One of the big controversies is to what extent our group's going to come back. So it's going to be a while. And so what we have to do is really figure out a way to ramp up that when we get to that three, four, five, I mean, there's certain parts of the market that are coming back a lot faster, air travel being one of them, and a lot of the businesses aren't ready. We're having issues. I don't know if you're facing the same thing, that a lot of businesses aren't finding the right talent to be able to staff for the increase in volume, especially the ones that are in the resort or rural location. So that's one. Thank you, Lakshmi, for your nice, kind comments. Uh, Sri Lakshmi asked a question with OTAs. You know, the the loyalty programs have been kind of the promise of loyalty programs was direct connect. Can we, in fact, find a way to create direct relationships with our customers? Hasn't happened as well, but that to me is where the, a lot of the big brands are going, is they're finding that more and more people are booking directly, more and more people are less price sensitive and they're booking as a loyalty member. So loyalty programs are moving in the direction of creating a more direct relation with customers and not having to rely on OTAs. Of course, you have to rely on OTAs where you can't fill your hotel otherwise, but I think paying attention to doing some of that is uh, is paying off for a lot of companies. Dilip Kumar asked a question, how do we uh, motivate the new aspirants of hotel management? You know, this is interesting you asked the question, Nish, because we were talking in the prep yesterday. There are a lot of people in this audience, they're sort of peaking in their careers, they're reaching really mid-career status, and all of a sudden we get the pandemic. And Mr. Moncar was telling me people have car loans and home loans and, you know, uh, fees to pay for their children to go to school. And all of a sudden, the bottom falls out of the market. So this is a tough time. And yet we have to double down on letting people know there's no more exciting, fun business than the business we're in. I mean, I've been in the business now 42 years. Mr. Moncar, you've been 45 years. We've devoted our lives to trying to help make this business better. And... There's no other job I'd rather be doing than being in this business. My business school students at Cornell tell me all the time, why don't you come across the street and teach in the business school? And I said, well, why would I be talking about light bulbs and toilet paper and toothpaste when I would talk about hotels, resorts, and restaurants? So uh, I think that message has to be sort of amped up. Uh, Lakshmi said, bring back to my memory of Cornell. It's wonderful. Uh, 
KS Narayan, we answered we answered your uh, points as well. Let's see. You know, Lakshmi, I did answer the question. So, you know, resorts before cities, domestic travel before international travel, leisure travel before business travel, and business travel before group travel. So clearly that's where the tendencies are in terms of recovery. So we have to prepare that that's how the pattern is going to be in the next weeks and months. Let's see if there's anything else. Uh, Manisha, well, I mean, go ahead. Yes, right on top. Grish, Ruben, Kataria, they all have asked certain questions. Wonderful, wonderful. I get to a question in a minute. So you got Manish's question, financially viable from year one. Uh, you know, Manish, part of the challenge also is going to be to really re-examine the economics of the business. To So I'll give you one trend that I think has been accelerated with the pandemic, and that is many developers today are saying the only way we can make the hotel work is mixed use. We have to provide a combination of transient plus residences, right? That could be one. So there's got to be other formula that I think are going to be, you know, condominiums were created in the mid 1970s only because that was a viable way for people to own a little piece of real estate and yet run it like a hotel. So a lot of people today experimenting with different ways on how to make the economics of the business work. And the traditional economics right now, of course, is is uh, out of the market. Okay, let's talk. Let's go to the top of the page. Yeah, so Grish says COVID, uh, COVID management. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. So, you know, Grish, you probably know this, but, you know, Four Seasons right away hired a director of hygiene. Who would have known that when we were growing up in the business that there would be actually a designated person by the way, we already had a doctor, we had a nurse, we had a doctor at the Oberoi New Delhi that would always be on call, but to have a chief hygiene officer deputed in the hotel just for the specific purpose of making feel comfortable. I think that is, I think that is here to stay because even though post-pandemic, there's always going to be issues, whether it's food poisoning or anything else, people are always concerned when they're not in their own homes that they could be subject to what other people are bringing in, employees and other guests as well. Uh, Ruben asked a question, any advice for hotel opening in the post-pandemic area? I don't want to say don't <laughs> as the advice, <laughs> but, you know, I was I quoted the other day by saying, you know, it's hard to sometimes match the cycles where you have hotel planning cycle, everything's in boom times. By the time you open, the cycle has gone down the other way. Uh, professor, yes, he has just opened a brand new property, Leela pa Bharatiya Palace in Bangalore. Yes. So to me, Ruben, the pressure is on, and that is you're clearly in the eye of the storm. You have a new product. It's just, you know, the old line about you never get a second chance to make a first impression. My question is, when you open your doors, what can you say to people? And here's, let me put a maybe an aspirational challenge for you. That is, what can you say to people that things that you offer are novel, unique, proprietary? I'll give you a quick example. So when the Mandarin Oriental was opening in London, it was in a, a very similar, not a, not exactly the same time, but in a recession. And I had the GM in my seminar in Cornell, and we were saying, you know, the Mandarin Oriental is a very high, as you can imagine, cost per key opening in the heart of London. And I said to him, "What's new to you?" He goes, "Well, we have a uh, we have a we have Harrods next door." And I go, uh, "Do you have uh, so? How about uh, some relationship with Harrods? Some unique, uh, value-added, proprietary relationship with Harrods?" He said, "Let me try." So he went back and he said, called, went, to, had to send a team to Harrods and said, hey, can we do a special shopping for uh, Mandarin customers? And Harrods goes, you know, we're Harrods. Go get lost. We have no time for this. So they insisted. And the Harrods said, you know what? Okay. So we'll, we'll do a trial, 30 days. For 30 days, we'll open the store an hour early just for Mandarin customers. You have special shopping hours exclusively for you. You're right next door. We'll try it out. And most likely it'll fail, but we'll give you 30 days. 10 days after the experiment started, a team from the Harrods came to Mandarin GM's office and said, very sorry, very sorry. We apologize. We're, oh, by the way, and they also said to the Mandarin Oriental, one hour, you will pay electricity. You will pay for staff salary for one hour, all the expenses. You will cover that. And they said, no problem. Within 10 days, they not only apologized. They said, no charge from one hour to two hours, free just for Mandarin customers. What happened? What they found was that this unique relationship between Mandarin and Harrods created this symbiosis where Mandarin customers are going to Harrods and given special shopping hours, are actually buying more on a per square foot per minute basis than the typical Harrods customer. And so my question is, if I come to your hotel in Bangalore 
what can I get with you that is new and different and exciting and nobody else can offer that? I know it's a big bar, it's a high bar, but can you think of some things that you can do for your guests that nobody else can do, which gives me a reason to say, you know what? If you're going to Bangalore and you got one place to stay, you got to stay with Ruben. Give me your response on chat if you're there. Okay. Let's see. What else we got? Oh, okay. Kenneth, thank you. Parachute of your mind. That's the idea, right? So I'm hoping that if not the actual thing we're talking about, but just in general, what I'm hoping will in, in sessions like this, it's really, as you know, not something that's being discussed, but maybe it triggers a thought in another direction so that when you walk away in a minute or two, when we're done with this, 90 minutes, you say to yourself, okay, so how is my business practice is going to be different from now on for the next days, weeks, and months than it were in the weeks and months and before I showed up at this thing. So I'm, I'm hoping one or two things will trigger. And if it does, please email me, let me know any new uh, things you put in place in your uh, in your practice. We're looks like we're running out of time. Uh, Mr. Mohan Kumar, do you want to make any final comments? No, please go ahead. Uh, there is still a lot of time. Uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, uh, you know, every moment for us is actually learning. Just Great. go ahead. Great. I think I've covered all of the, uh, the, the, let's see, Manisha asked a question. What do you think about the future of small, oh boy, fa small family hotels. The big brands are not ready to accept the small hotels to support. OTAs are drawing their part of flesh. You know, Manish, the expression between a rock and a hard place. You know, I do see small hotels, family-run hotels, independent hotels that you don't have the same protection you have with the big brands. Plus, OTAs know they can charge you instead of 10, 15%, they can charge 15, 20, 25% commission. I know because I look at their statements and I work for some of them and I know that they get a much higher, you know, markup in, uh, in the small independent hotels. I think the thing to do, and I'll give you a kind of a short version, a very long story. I had a a former student whose family ran a hotel on the island of Crete uh, in Greece. And he was having the same problem. It was a different context, but the same parallel. His trouble was trying to convince tour operators not to steal from him because he said every day, every year, they would ask for more stuff for their guests and want to pay me less money. And I said to him, I said, you've got to start, you've got to renegotiate, rebalance the relationship with the OTA. You've got to really be smart about when you need them, when you don't, uh, you're, in the, you're on the same team. The OTAs want their customers served well. You want to serve your customers well is look at the data you have and try to see if you can make a kind of a logical, rational argument for whatever it is you're asking. If they sh You should not be paying, for example, very high commission rates in periods where you could get the business on your own. On the other hand, if you get OTA to, OTAs to bring you brand new business that you couldn't have got, get on your own, then a 20, 25% commission may not be such a bad idea. So trying to sort of get in their head and figure out where they're coming from and sort of deal with them on much more of an analytical data-based way, I think will help you. It took, by the way, it's not a quick uh, answer because it took this guy on Crete three years to recalibrate, uh, studying the data, looking at the patterns, talking to his customers, really trying to reconfigure the relationship so that there was more of a win-win than they were winning and he was losing. So I wish I had an easy, short answer. It's just a matter of working it, just sort of recalibrating the relationship between you and the OTA. Sit down with them and say, I'm happy with the business you're giving me, but I'm paying too much for it at the right, wrong times. Uh, what can we do differently? There is a Sri Lakshmi Nair, a young lady, general manager, asking a question, Professor. Is it while about? hotels battle with OTAs, do you think loyalty programs be a game changer? Yes, I, I actually addressed that. Yes, okay. we, did, we had that. Yeah, and Lakshmi Tolvan says hello to you, brings back my memories of Kodan. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, there is also Mr. K. S. Narayan, he says uh, price is a pretty sensitive issue, although it may not be the first one to bring it down, but all the three P's are connected to price and hence has to go hands in glove with yeah. each of the P's, revenue, profit and gen profit generation. Right. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. I would like to say again, I couldn't have said any better. Uh, I just want you to think about instead of leading with price, price price discounts is using that as your last weapon in your arsenal, the last quiver, arrow in your quiver. Thank you, Professor. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, Lakshmi asked a question, your student. How long will it take for the hotels in the cities to revive? The resorts, the, especially the driving res resorts in and around any of the mega cities in India, already 
kind of got back to operations. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's a busy business hotels in the cities. That's a, that's a, that's of a big concern because the travel has not really got back into full steam. Right. So city hotels, international travel, group travel is probably the last to recover. Resort travel, domestic travel, as we found, is really been picking up in in a lot of places, getting close to 2019 levels. So that's going to be the hardest part uh, to bring back. Thank you. And Delhi Pass, uh, during the times of VUCA, we are worried about sustainability. Uh, but when things get normal, <laughs> will the mass tourism come back with its old phase? That's a very good question because Goa right now is facing an existential threat in terms of mass tourism. Right. And, you know, I think Rish made the point about, um, or was it Matthew that made the point about sustainability and how, you know, we're accidentally becoming sustainable because of COVID. But we're also, remember, we're also scaling back on housekeeping services. We're also giving services on demand. So in a sense, we are using COVID as the excuse to recalibrate our relationship with the guest and the guest experience. Some of this actually might be sustainable. So think about the fact that imagine if you were to say to yourself that post-pandemic, hypothetically now, we're in discussion space, so all ideas on the table, is imagine post-pandemic that housekeeping becomes an a la carte service option. What about that? What about if you say, you know what, we're going to give you the room price. There's no housekeeping included. You get at the beginning and you get the end, you know, when the room turns over and we'll, we'll rate it out for you. So that way you are able to consume less resources. As I said, even amenities in room. Uh, think about the fact that there may be an opportunity to, depending on the tier you're at, of course, luxury and economy and budget will be very different. But how can you decouple some of the packages and say to yourself, we can do these as value added options, but if you don't want to pay for them, you don't have to. So you can run the operation with a much different, much differently configured, configured system. So think of the way in which, so the, the ultimate uh, thing that I think we lose sight of, and maybe this is a good thing to close on, and that is I often ask people in my executive program and class at Cornell, maybe there's a, you know, I'm going to keep my chat open. This is a good chance to ask the group one last question. And here's my last question I want to leave you with. And that is, why do people stay in hotels? Why do people buy a hotel room? Why do people book a hotel room? If there's anything I've learned after being in the business for 42 years and 33 years as a professor in good standing at Cornell, I've realized that underlying everything that people do, there's only one primary motivation. And I want you to tell me, what is the primary motivation for why anybody goes to a hotel? Anybody? AIM students, anybody can jump in. What's the real reason why anybody, that's, that never changes? Anybody want to take that shot? Yeah, I'm looking it at that. Very good. Yeah. Kenneth says convenience. But, you know, Kenneth, I could argue with you and say, uh, it's not convenient because sometimes we go out of our way to stay at a hotel, to find a hotel that's really not convenient, but we go there because that's what we want. Comfort, all right. Sri Lakshmi says change. You know, uh, Sri Lakshmi, I can argue with you sometimes. I, it's not change. It's familiar. I want something familiar. That's why you have these chains, you know, it's a McDonald's, a Holiday Inn or Hilton. Comfort. Sometimes I'm I'm putting myself in discomfort by being at your experience. Experience, Amesh mentioned, that's another good one. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, luxury and pampering, not always, not always. Change, experience, Manisha says, right? You, you've always figured out by now it's a trick question. And so if you use the word change, for example, or if you use the word somebody said, you know, we have a need, is let me, I'm showing my age here now. Uh, okay, Ajay, you're getting close. So if I was to change a one word in a very famous line, in a very famous movie, for those of you that have seen or now will go see the movie Apollo 13, Tom Hanks, who was one of the lead characters in the movie Apollo 13, could have said while he was in the capsule coming down to Earth, it's a very famous line that you'll understand even if you haven't seen the movie. Yeah. He could have said, Houston, we have a need. But in fact, he said, Houston, we have a Houston, we have a opportunity. No, Houston, we have a. Imagine yourself hurtling down to earth at thirty-seven miles an hour. 
challenge. Right. Houston, we have a problem <laughs> because the, the capsule was starting to short circuit. So the only reason anybody ever comes to a hotel is because they have a problem. Now, you might say to me, I had a group on the wall of us, wait, 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 wait. We're paying all this money, spending all this time to learn this. It sounds very rough, you know, have a problem. I said, it doesn't have to be a bad problem, it's a good problem. You're trying to connect with a business partner. You're trying to connect with a loved one, with a child or a parent or grandparent or a friend or a schoolmate, right? So if the only reason anybody ever goes to a hotel is because they have a problem, what's the only business you can ever be in? The business of, don't all speak at once. What's the primary purpose of your business? Should be the primary purpose of your Resolving business. Solutions. Right. Resolving problems, yeah. So from now on, when I come on my next trip to India and I visit all your hotels and I talk to one of your associates, one of your employees, when I walk up to an employee in your hotel, there's only one thing, I want, one title I would like to see on the name tag of all your employees. One <laughs> title. And that is? Solutions, <laughs> solutions manager. <laughs> Problem solver. Right. Yeah, because I would say 99% of the time when any guest approaches any employee, other than saying, hello, how are you? How's your family? How's the weather? Most times they're asking, can I get something? I can, I need some help. I have a problem. I need a solution. Right. So the only business you can be. However, we have chosen, all of us have chosen a particular domain within which to solve problems. So, of course, we're hospitality, we're high touch, we know we're experience based, all the things you've said. But in the end, so if the primary purpose of our business is problem solving, I don't think we spend enough time understanding the problems that our guests are facing and all of them differently across time, as I think was mentioned earlier about the, the whole wellness situation, in order for us to get bold, relevant, authentic, novel, and distinct solutions to offer to our guests. And to me, that's the name of the game, is how do you try to, how do you find better solutions tomorrow? Sometimes the problem is the same, sometimes the problems are different, but spending enough time. So let me sort of leave you with this final thought, and that is next time a guest checks into the hotel and you're standing in the lobby, or maybe you're the one that picks up the phone for that reservation call, what's the one indispensable question you must ask every guest? And I'll give you a hint. It's kind of has a little bit of a New York flavor to it. What's the question? What's the question you have to ask the guest without fail? Anybody? I gotta leave you with a New York moment, the fact that I'm in New York now, yeah. is what's your problem? Yeah. Right. Not in so many words, of course, <laughs> you know, but it's really trying to pay attention to that part because we have so many myriad solutions, all these things we've discussed, with some staffing or this or that, is in the end, right, not even directly. Rekha, I was being more direct to say, let me put another, take a few extra minutes. You know, the GMs that say goodbye to their guests in the hotel lobby, many of you have done that. Yeah. What's the most frequent question that GMs ask departing guests? Either you know you can guess. The most frequent question that general managers ask departing guests. What is the most frequently asked question? Simple, and basic. Let, 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 let's give the folks a chance. All right, somebody else. Yeah. yeah. The most frequently asked question by GMs to departing guests. Somebody's got to have an answer to this. Very good, Ken. How was your stay? Of course. Given what I just said to you in the last three minutes, what's the one question you must always ask a departing guest? Instead of saying, how is your stay? What might be another question you might ask that might give you more insight, more direct material? Very good, Ruben. Not just that, one thing. What's the one thing I could have done to make your stay? Just one thing. And my job is then to make sure the next time you're back, it's not just that one thing, but it's that one thing plus another thing that I know that is going to make your, so it's kind of going off the topic a little bit, but the idea is you see is you've got to stop back.
back to somebody mentioned back to basics. It's yeah. really about re-energizing your inquiry, re-energizing, asking you the question, asking the question of the gas is, do we really, really understand in these crisis times, the one that understand the gas problems the best, I would submit to you, is that property is going to do the best possible job in not only satisfying that gas, but also getting them back. On that note, I have to bid you farewell. I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It was great to interact with you. I'm sorry we couldn't all be together in a room. It's kind of odd to see you guys in the chat, but at least I see some names and there's some connection there. Mr. Mohan Kumar, I wanted to thank you and Mr. Reddy for uh, your support for this venture. And you know, it's uh, it's always a pleasure. It's never enough time, too many topics, um, but just I'm glad to have joined you. And I, I'm happy to bring whatever I have learned in these 42 years to bear on some little way to help uh, the industry move forward. So a couple of seconds for me. Um... Uh, obviously, I have to express it, you know, and, and I don't know how much to express. Words really fail me. You know, all that I can say is that uh, uh, I have never, you know, it, there are moments in everyone's life where uh, it, it lasts forever. There's a huge impact, right? Uh, and that's what all hoteliers expect to do with their guests, right? How, how do you create everlasting memories? I think, Professor, you have really walked the talk. You've been... You know, you have come as a messiah of good hope to all of us in India, honestly. And I want to just, uh, you know, um, congratulate you uh, and offer you our sincere thanks. And I just want to say, you know, uh, there are so many key words. Uh, you know, I have written about nearly 10 pages of mm -hmm. all the key words that you've, uh, you know, mentioned. And they're all going to be like some kind of a navigational chart for all of us. But I just want to say that... Um, I've seen a lots of uh, brilliant ads about hospitality. And one of the things that I would to relate with you is, you know, you, you represent the science, the art, the emotion, and the beauty of hospitality. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. On behalf of Ames, uh, Hotel General Managers Guild India, and all the General Managers and every hospitality professional in this country, we wish you all the very best, very best. Um, we all, we all, our prayers for your good health and peace and, and we look forward to you have won the hearts and minds of all of us so we will be vying with each other to actually welcome you to, uh, to our cities uh, as in whenever you uh, decide to come back home for a for a vacation thank you uh, professor dave thank you very much honor and delight to be with you okay Take bye care. bye and thank you so much priyanand reddy uh, uh, baska and uh, sayed and all of you friends uh, it's been a wonderful, uh, you know, uh, experience going through this. And uh, this is one of the dreams that have come true. I always, you know, this is a dream that's going uh, on in my mind in the last two years, Professor Dave, to bring in. Because ever since I actually attended your classes, this is one name that I came to my mind. It says that, you know, someone who I had to bring into all the General Managers Guild. And in fact, actually, you have elevated the status of General Managers Guild in India, honestly. You know, among all the 13, 14 webinars that I've conducted, you know, uh, you, your reputation obviously precedes you, but you have, you know, we are seeing, uh, uh, like they say, the god of cricket in, uh, in, in Sachin Tendulkar. So far, we are seeing you as the god of hospitality in terms of a guru. And no praises are just enough to describe the kind of knowledge, uh, the thought processes, the insights, you know, and the way you articulated it. That's important. You know, there are many brilliant thought leaders who may not necessarily be so impactful, but you combine the best of everything, sir, honestly. And I'm not just, uh, you know, expressing my uh, ability. I have the ability to communicate and talk, but this is coming from my heart, honestly. I have all of us. So, Baska, thank you. Priyanand Reddy, thank you uh, for making it happen. And I hope uh, we will have a lot of you in the years ahead. India is going to be a superpower, a soft superpower. Our dream is to make India the hospitality capital of the world. Wonderful. And what makes hospitality the, uh, the best in the world is the people. So we have enough talent and I hope some of us will become, some of the young GMs will become the CEOs of major hotel companies in the world. Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is anyone who wants to spend a few